Oh, hey, Ian. You wanted to see me? Yeah, hi, Josh. Uh, just a little heads up. We're about to reveal some pretty important lore at Gamescom, and uh, we thought you should probably know about it before we did. Nice hat. Thanks. Uh, I was playing on my shaman the other day, and something happened that made me want to wear a hat. Yeah, okay, great. So anyway, we're about to release a new cinematic, which is going to take the expansion in a whole new direction. Sounds great. Yeah, we're really excited. Okay, so picture the scene. Ashara, the Sundering. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's cast into the depths of the ocean. All around her is darkness, but she keeps on going, right to the very bottom. And what do you think she finds there? Oh, wow, I think I know. This is so exciting. Yeah, that's right. A faction war. What? At the bottom of the sea is even more faction war. Like fish in alliance tabards, they're fighting crabs in horde tabards. Sylvanas is there, she's burning stuff. Anduin is crying. It's amazing. Oh, I see. So no old gods? Well, why would there be old gods? Battle for Azeroth is an expansion about the faction war. What use would an old god serve? I just... I really thought with the whole Ashara and underwater thing, there might be some old gods. Okay, fine. There's an old god. Really? Yeah, and he has a terrible, dark, unknowable secret. Awesome. Yeah, like, is the old god Horde or Alliance? No. Which side will they choose? How morally grey are they? I've got to go. Knowledge is power. Hello Internet, and welcome to another episode of The Weekly Reset, Taliesin and Evertel's Wondrous Wisdom Show, and... <laughs> Oh man, what a show we have for you today, because as if there wasn't enough to talk about anyway with Ian and Law's Q&A and eye level scaling and important loot changes and secret pets that are no longer secret and secret mounts that are so secret it turns out they never even existed, as if that wasn't enough, we finally got that long-awaited Queen Ashara Warbringer animation at Gamescom and it is a beauty. And you see, here's our dilemma. We want to do a proper Taliesin Talks analysis for something like that, where we really get under the skin of it and highlight all the themes and references and meanings because that's the kind of thing we like to do. Obviously it came out on a Friday when this show has already started production. But okay, that's not a problem, we'll just make the analysis part of the weekly reset instead. That's the joy of having a weekly show after all. And having decided that, usually we do all of the proper news first, like the Q&A and gosh I don't know, maybe see what the forums are saying. And then we talk about the Warbringer just to finish off. That is our by now quite well established format. But shit, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to talk about this right now, and then we can do the other news later, okay? Because it's my show, and that's how we're going to do it, okay? Oh, actually, hang on. Is that okay, Evertel? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. It's half my show, and that's how we're going to do it, okay? Because there was so much hype surrounding this Warbringer for a few reasons. There's the fact that the first two in the series, Jaina and Sylvanas, were both really brilliant pieces of work, but also full of some incredibly important story, which is straight up vital to understanding the action so far in Battle for Azeroth, and because it's taken us so long to actually see it. Because as it became clearer that we wouldn't be getting the Ashara instalment until after the new expansion was live, so it became clearer that the purpose of this cinematic was also going to be different from those first two. Because whereas the pre-patch animations set up the action of BFA and put us on a certain path, this one, you suspected, was going to alter our trajectory a little. To the point where many observers, myself included, wouldn't have been surprised if Blizzard had gone the whole hog in Germany and announced a Naga-themed 8.1 alongside this film. Something which didn't happen in the end, but no one's complaining because honestly, there is so much stuff to be getting on with here, which we will talk about now. And our analysis today is brought to you with the help of the special guest star, the Puzzle Box of Yog saron And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but hang on Taliesin, the Puzzle Box is a very old god themed toy that gives out old god style whispers when you have it in your bags, telling you about really old god things like the sleeping city of Nihilotha and stuff like that. What relevance could those things possibly have to battle for Azeroth, which as everyone knows is an expansion about the faction war. There are no old gods in Battle for Azeroth. And you're absolutely right, of course you are, there aren't at all, not even slightly, but let's take the puzzle box along with us anyway just in case. And please remember that, as usual, this is not a reaction video. If you haven't already seen this cinematic, then right now is a terrible way to watch it, because we're going to be stopping and starting and going back over bits and just generally talking all over the top of it, because this one is just jammed with significance. And although it's very different in content to the first two animations in the series, in many ways it shares
shares a lot of the same themes and imagery, but not at the very start, where both the previous animations began in the aftermath of destruction, to the extent that the opening shot of each is glowing embers flowing across the screen. Ashara's Warbringer places us in the moment just before the destruction. Instead of being greeted by ruins and death, this time we're afforded a glimpse of a great and powerful civilization at the height of its powers, Zin Ashari, the city named after its queen. Of course, the first two Warbringers take place in the present, whereas what we're seeing now happened 10,000 years ago. This is ancient Azerothian history we're watching here, and as the shadow begins to loom over the rooftops, those who know our pretend fantasy history know exactly where we're at. The Sundering, where the Well of Eternity collapsed in on itself at the climax of the War of the Ancients. Malfurion, Tyrande, and Illidan succeeded in stopping Queen Ashara from bringing the Burning Legion into Azeroth and destroying the planet. There's another contrast with the previous Warbringers in the way that we're introduced to our main character too, whereas Jaina and Sylvanas are both presented to us from behind, surveying the devastation that has already taken place. Ashara's entrance is very different. <laughs> trying to keep the destruction away at her back and trying to save her people, the Highborn. And apart from being a demonstration right off the bat of just how powerful Ashara is, this shit is scary. Look how scared this building is. It's safe to say I've never seen a building look quite so scared of a massive wave before and it, it makes me scared too. Now of course even if you don't know this particular story, you've seen the other two Warbringers. You know that both of them are about leaders losing their homes and their families and the change that they go through in the wake of that destruction. So you can probably guess that this isn't going to end well for Ashara. This shot of the waters flowing over the walls unhindered at the other side of the city indicating the the ultimate futility of her efforts. And yes, this is the end of Scared Building. Goodbye, Scared Building. We often think of Ashara as being quite one-dimensional, driven by vanity over all else, and that's definitely true, but there's no doubt that she is giving every last drop of her strength to hold these waves back here and protect the civilians, whether that be for selfless reasons or because her vanity won't allow her to accept that her empire is being destroyed. And it's really cool how that enormous effort is shown by time slowing down and the background noises fading out, till we're left to focus on this pathetic fish flapping about helplessly in front of her. An image which would still be really powerful, even if the weirdly red-eyed fish didn't turn out to be very important later on. Losing its fight for life on dry land, just as Ashara is doomed to lose her. Ooh, and her face reflected in the water, because that's where she's going to be in just a moment. Spoiler, sorry, that's a spoiler. The, the fish's weirdly red eye, in sharp contrast to Ashara's golden eyes, of course. Ashara famously had golden eyes because she was so un usually powerful. They're a really important part of her identity, of herself. And despite the voice telling her in her own voice that it's over and to let go, she resolutely refuses to give in until she simply can't hold on any longer. And this moment, which is very reminiscent of the moment Sylvanas becomes a banshee in her Warbringer. Because Ashara is about to go on a little transformative journey of her own. And look, we haven't even properly started this cinematic yet. Now we begin because a queen has made it to the water, sorry. And suddenly this is much more recognizable as a Warbringer animation, as the angle that Shara and her people are drawn down into the depths matches that of the embers that open the other two cinematics. The bubbles and detrius of the water traveling past the camera here are the equivalent of those embers in the aftermath of destruction. And as her crown slips from her head, she watches it float upwards away from her because from being the most powerful living creature on the planet, from being on the cusp of teaming up with Sargeras and ruling everything, Ashara is now the queen of no one, of nowhere, of nothing. And can there be any worse fate for her than that? Now the circular imagery in this cinematic is pretty blatant and everywhere, as we'll see. And as the crown frames the disappearing sun circled by the bodies of the dead, it's obviously a lot like when Jaina sees the faces of the dead circling around her on her psychological ghost canoe, and also, of course, the maelstrom, which is being formed at this moment. But it's impossible not to also think of Ilganoth's whisper in the Emerald Nightmare. To find him, drown yourself in the circle of stars. 
Wells. And as she passes out here, we have a strange scene, which is the closest that this cinematic gets to its Arthas moment. Because every cinematic in the pre-patch had an Arthas reference, and these glowing-eyed, scourge-like dead highborn are like the scourge that Sylvanas battles and the ghosts that torment Jaina. But this is just a vision, just a nightmare. Because actually now I feel like this cinematic is just beginning, because this is where it does something brilliant. <laughs> It gets very quiet, very still, and really quite scary. Because as this fever dream, this nightmare makes her cry out, suddenly we and Ashara are somewhere totally alone, completely featureless, and very, very dark. Or as Yogg's puzzle box might put it, at the bottom of the ocean, even light must die. There is a very real sense that we are in someone else's realm here. Not to mention the fact that Ashara is somehow, for the time being, alive. And then we hear it. A voice we've been waiting for years and years to hear. <laughs> deal. I like Deal. Who are you? Hey, just a thought, but you know who else likes Deals? A little chap you may have heard of, Wonsambi. And you know who his boss is, don't you? Well, no you don't. It's a tantalising mystery. I'm just putting it out there. And can I just say that as someone who grew up by the sea and who loves being on the sea, but is absolutely terrified of the thought of being under it, to the extent that I literally couldn't play Subnautica because it freaked me out too much. All of what happens next really speaks to some of my deepest fears in a really big way. Like, I'm not ashamed to admit that just this image here scares me, and I like it. And Ashara is, if not scared, certainly very wary. You can see how on edge she is, desperately trying to assess what's going on and plan her next move, because that's what Ashara does. That deal she just referred to is the deal that she made with Sargeras and the Burning Legion, where she would let them into Azeroth through the Well of Eternity, then marry Sargeras, kill all the lesser races on the planet, and just basically be an intergalactic badass for all eternity. But we digress. Show yourself! At once! <laughs> We have a sharp horror movie noise and a flash of movement behind the shadows because lest we forget, the Queen is not in charge here. She is very much on someone else's turf. And this voice, who is Darren DePaul by the way, wastes no time in telling her For a thousand years, bound beneath these waves, I have watched you. And he has tasted her essence. Wait, is that right? I have tasted your essence. Okay, hang on, have we arrived at some kind of underwater sex party where it's all tentacles and tasting each other's essences? Because if that's the case, then obviously I'm in. But this is actually a reference, I think, to Nazoth's Hearthstone card. So what the voice is saying here is he understands the inner workings of Ashara's soul. He knows what drives her and he knows how to appeal to that. And this entity that we're dealing with here finally makes some kind of visual appearance a fish with familiar glowing red eyes. Although me just saying that doesn't really do it justice because this is one of the scariest entries of a small fish that I can ever remember seeing in any media. <laughs> And obviously, we all suspect we know who we're actually dealing with by now. So we, as the audience, know that this is just a form that is being taken for ease of communication. As the puzzle box of Yog saron says, the fish know all of the answers. They know the cold. They know the dark. So, you know, it's just lucky that you haven't ever done anything to piss off the fish, basically, is what I'm saying. Oh, hang on. Oh, shit. And a fish can obviously swim all around Ashara with ease, completely owning the space and highlighting what an alien and unnatural environment this is for her. Which is exactly what he does as he tells her It won't be long now. Your death is near. Only I can sustain you. And just like when the fish voice told her to let go topside in Zinashara, again, we see Ashara reflected in that glassy red eye. Let go. Serve me. We have that same image again as the voice tells her to give in and serve him. And with Ashara being unimpressed by the idea of a life of fish servitude, the voice changes and becomes massive and distorted and otherworldly and suddenly many, many eyes open and light up and this happens. 
I am a god! Before you walk this land, I ruled. Oh, so there are old gods in BFA after all! Well, I've got to say, Blizzard, you kept those very close to your chest. You had me completely fooled from the start. I feel like such an idiot now. So here's the thing. What's actually happening here isn't a massive surprise, but the importance of it for the world of Warcraft is as big as it gets. And the significance of us seeing this now has huge importance for the direction the game is heading in. Because this, ladies and gentlemen, is Nazoth. Just as that essence line confirmed a few seconds ago, and this moment, this shot, is so important. Because Nazoth is a name we've known for years, but this is the very first time we've ever actually seen a representation of it in any canon World of Warcraft media. So that's important in itself, but for me personally, what's even more important is how they've chosen to portray it. I use it because in Chronicle the old gods aren't given pronouns, but I'm gonna say him from now on because it's voiced by Darren DePaul and that's just easier. Like most boys with a passing interest in fantasy, I am a massive Lovecraft fan. His work, obviously, not his pretty appalling racism and homophobia. And as such, the old gods in Warcraft, which are essentially direct lifts from his literary universe, have always been by far the most interesting antagonists in the game for me because they have that same ancient, unknowable, unspeakable quality to them. A power and influence that we can only ever catch glimpses of but never understand and that even witnessing will cause madness at the huge scope of it all. And so I've been waiting forever for them to do old gods properly in WoW but also kind of scared that when they did they would mess it up. So this shot and in fact the rest of this whole cinematic isn't just great because it's exciting and well made and packed full of references, it's also important for me because it shows us Blizzard might just be about to get it right when it comes to the old gods in a very very big way. And I'll explain why. So here we see a vast and ancient city, just like the one and only official depiction of the Black Empire that we saw in Chronicle, which dominated the entire planet under the rule of the Old Gods, as they went about trying to corrupt the world soul of Azeroth before the Titans turned up and sort of saved the day. And I know lots of people think that this is a vision that Nazoth is giving Ashara here, a vision of the past and how all-powerful Nazoth was, and now it's clear why Zin Ashara was portrayed as being all white. It was to contrast the very opposite, very dark architecture here. And I know that everyone agrees that this is a vision, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but I also think this is real. That there is no vision or projection going on here, that the light radiating from the many eyes of this gigantic god are literally illuminating the seafloor and the depths, and that we are seeing the actual city of Nihilotha on the seabed here. And here's why I think this. It makes sense that Nihilotha is a Black Empire city. Nihilotha is a city of old, terrible, unnumbered crimes. When the Titans dealt with the old gods, they couldn't move them, they imprisoned them where they were. So it makes sense that Nazoth was bound to the city, and then he and it were hidden out of sight under the depths where he's been ever since. In the sunken city, he lays dreaming. I think the physical way that Ashara reacts to it suggests it's real and not projection, and also it's just scarier if it's real, isn't it? The idea that seconds ago we were enveloped in a claustrophobic darkness because there is no sunlight in the depths. The only light is that which the old god gives us. Down here, he is our sun and moon. And in giving us this glimpse of the structures that were all around us but that we just had no idea were there, he's showing us that there is so little we know or understand about exactly what's down here. Nihilotha is basically Rulye in Lovecraftian mythos, the sunken city where dead Cthulhu lies dreaming. Sounds familiar. And much is made of its geometry, angles that don't make sense, and surfaces that are too vast to even exist. This is what Rulye, and therefore, Nihilotha looks like. And we know that's where Nazoth is, so why wouldn't this be it? Even the drums that start at this point are a Lovecraft reference. The vile playing of drums is associated with one of the grand cosmic outer gods in Lovecraftian mythos. And you might be thinking, alright Talia, that one's a bit of a stretch, but do you still think it's a stretch when I tell you that outer god's name is Azathoth? And it's that incomprehensible scale which Blizz is getting right here. And that's why I'm so hopeful. These images of the vast tentacles weaving through these huge, ancient, silent columns in the sleeping city of Nihilotha walk only mad things. Are mind-blowing! And Ashara is suitably impressed as she utters Magnificent. She clearly wants some of this, but 
even in this situation where she's seeing things no living creature was ever meant to see, she gathers herself remarkably quickly and you can see an idea spring up in her head as she says, No. Yes, fresh from the forced cancellation of her engagement to Sargeras and total destruction of her city and empire, she's now playing hardball with Nazoth. This is a bold move and Nazoth does not take it well, or at least he doesn't seem to take it well. As Ashara essentially says, listen Squid Boy, either we do it my way with me as queen or you kill me and you... The god of nothing. And there's that word again. Varian is the king who sacrificed his life for nothing. Sylvanas told Anduin that he had won nothing. And now here, it's almost like nothing is important. What's another word for nothing? I Nazoth cries out and disappears back into the darkness and we have this amazing close-up sequence of Ashara's face. Because at the start she's obviously pretty pleased with how she's handled these negotiations and is waiting for a triumphant response. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Oh, and actually there's just one thing missing. That's better. And the art here is amazing because with the minimum of animation, they really capture her slow panic as it suddenly occurs to her that she may well have overplayed her hand a little bit. And the silence and the loneliness is just exquisite. Before the crashing noise and violence of the transformative body horror, which is another chapter of the Lovecraft playbook, as these dark cosmic forces twist and break and reform her, and you can see her golden eyes almost being burned from her. Because despite how in control she thinks she is, she isn't her Ashara anymore. That defining feature characteristic is disappearing, and as the music of the drums swells, we get for me what is the money shot. The outline of the deformed, terrible new Ashara against the darkness is suddenly silhouetted in the bright red glow of, yes, an eye. And there is so much going on here. The obvious reference is to Ashara in the womb being reborn in her new master's image. For me, there's a slight suggestion of Hakan, but also this scene from Atlantis, the Lost Kingdom, which is another reason why I think this is actually Nyarlathotep we're seeing here, as it's a lost sunken kingdom. But most of all, it's just awesome because of how big this means Nazoth is. This is the size of one eye, and we know he's got lots of eyes. This thing is absolutely incomprehensible levels of huge. And yes, please, I like incomprehensible when it comes to old gods. And as he bellows, arise, Kerrigan, sorry, arise, Ashara, we see that she has a few new eyes herself and a brand new shiny crown of eyes and tentacles. And if you still don't think Nyarlathotep is actually there, then what is this city reflected in the giant eye here? This pupil, which is like the sun Sun radiating its light on these new people. The former highborn who are now Naga so new that they haven't even had time to grow their third and fourth arms yet. And Ashara's having a gay old time because she thinks she's won, but her eyes and the eyes of her people now glow with that red of Nazoth. I certainly don't think Nazoth was as angry or upset as he made out. The drowned god's heart is black as ice. But I think we can all agree that this is... <sighs> Now, bearing in mind all of this happened 10,000 years ago, as an employer, I wouldn't blame Nazoth if he's starting to wonder exactly why Ashara is taking so long to build the empire. But anyway, it certainly looks like all of this is going to be very, very important to the story going forward, doesn't it? And although Blizzard didn't actually announce 8.1 or the next raid after Uldir at Gamescom, they kind of didn't need to, because as a statement, this works pretty well. This is the future of Battle for Azeroth, beyond the faction war and going into something much, much bigger. It's got me thinking, surely we can't kill Ashara in the 8.1 raid as everyone expects. Surely after this kind of introduction, we need more from her than a second tier raid on the way to frying bigger fish. But it does seem pretty inevitable that there will be maybe an actual underwater Naga themed raid coming soon, probably set in Najatar, which is the city they built for themselves over the last 10,000 years. I guess we'll find out at BlizzCon, but what this this cinematic has really done is whet my appetite for more old gods. And the thing is, I've got a feeling that Blizzard fully intend to appease that appetite. In The Call of Cthulhu, part of Rilier is raised to the surface and Cthulhu is accidentally temporarily released. That 
surely has to be where the story is heading with Nazoth and Nihilothan. We've already had hints at what that might be like with those weird quests you get along the coast of Sormsom, with its Lovecraftian quest giver, Madness Bar, and Dark Souls references. A whole raid? A whole patch of a Rillier type island where the angles and geometry make no sense, and where Blizzard found ways to make the player uncomfortable that went beyond tentacle faced mobs to kill on world quests would be mind blowing. It's a big ask, but after seeing some of the aesthetics they've chosen to go with here, my hopes, maybe for the first time, a very high. There is a lot more to be said about all of this, and we will in the coming weeks and months, I'm sure. But for now, we should probably look at some actual news. Hey, how's your Battle for Azeroth experience so far? You got to max level? How's your rep grinding coming on so far? I only ask because, you know, don't forget that you need that 7th Legion and Honorbowed reputation all the way to Exalted to unlock your Dark Iron Dwarves and Magar Orc allied races. I mean, there's no rush, obviously. Take your time. It's not a race. But just so you know, if it were a race, then you've totally lost because there are people who are already hitting Exalted, completing their war campaigns, and getting their hands on them. I mean, Alliance players anyway, because their wanted quests actually gave them reputation. And of course, that OP human racial helps a lot too. So you won't see any Magar orcs for a day or two, but next time you log in, there might well be a few glowing red beards smoking around Boralus. Actually, it looked for a moment that players had completed the requirements so quickly that it even took Blizzard by surprise, as they still had beta locks on the recruitment quest line in place, which meant that you couldn't actually start the process of unlocking them. That's been fixed now, and the recruitment scenarios are a bit more substantial than for previous allied races too. Still no word on when Kul Tiran humans or Xandalari trolls will become available. I guess that'll be a BlizzCon thing. I mean, I've literally had the leadership of Kul Tiras kneeling in front of me and pledging their allegiance to my cause after Jaina and I saved their whole civilization, but apparently that's not enough. Apparently there's something else I have to do first and look, I don't want to cause shit or anything, but if that recruitment scenario doesn't involve getting on a boat with Rosaline and killing a big ass squid, then honestly, I don't know why Blizzard are even bothering at this point. Actually, now I think about it, I don't even need the full allied race, just Rosaline. I basically just want to be Rosaline. And there were some really great fresh discoveries in game this week too, because the WoW Secrets Finding Discord have been finding some awesome stuff, which appears to be just the tip of a new awesome stuff iceberg. It all started with the discovery of a hidden note atop the Citadel by the Heart of Darkness in the center of Nazmir. A note which said simply, begin at the beginning, marking the start of a quest that sends you back to the Broken Isles and all over Xandalar and Kul Tiris and even beyond before we discover what it is we've even been looking for. Bal, the moody dark goat who bears just the slightest passing resemblance to Chris Metzen. When you finally find Bal, he's impossible to defeat, unless and this is where it gets really good, you summon Una. Yes, remember that sad little Draenei girl spirit that we told you months ago to get Nargis? Yes, that Una, who will weaken him and make him defeatable, and congratulations, because you now have the coolest pet in the game, because, and this is where it gets really, really good, Bal is a walking, talking, milkable puzzle box of Yog saron The first thing he says when you summon him is, souls feast on endless shrieking, in darkness they writhe and scream, you will join them together forevermore! With certain letters capitalized which form an anagram of seek knowledge which should be familiar to regular viewers of this show because it's a riddle we featured and solved months ago without even knowing what it was because here's the amazing thing once you have bell it seems he is the start point for what might be multiple other secret treasure hunts one has already been solved by the secret finding community to uncover the waste of time transmog belts now i know what you're thinking you're thinking hey didn't the waste of time used to have a hilariously in appropriate swinging pendulum hanging from it. And yes, when it was first data mined, it certainly did. But alas, not anymore. Because apparently telling someone you've been tasting their essence without consent is an absolutely fine thing to do, but a giant phallic timepiece crosses some blizzard decency line. Or perhaps you need to find the hilarious pendulum at the end of another treasure hunt. Because now we've established that Bal is the secret quest starting pet of choice, who's to say he can't start a new hunt anytime the devs feel like it? And of course, if you want to get a hold of the waste of time, Una, Bal, and all of the future secrets that he might reveal, then we'd really recommend the extremely detailed, exhaustive wowhead guides, which we've linked in the description. And finally, to Thursday's Q&A with Ian and Lore, in which the dynamic duo wore matching t-shirts like an old couple on a package cruise holiday, and Lore wore a hat indoors because he's clearly some kind of feral thug. Have I been in the UK too long? I've probably been in the UK too long. Now I know people like to make fun of these Q&As a bit, 
including us, it's true. But honestly, I think they're so important. And yeah, sometimes it's not all that illuminating, but then other times, like this time, it can be really insightful and really help explain the team's thinking behind a lot of their decisions. I love how seriously Ian takes every question. Uh, what's going on with the world scaling? Well, so just take off your Heart of Azeroth and put it in the bank, and then everything is fixed. Moving on? Uh, no, so, sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, look, he takes them all seriously eventually, okay? I like him, and I trust him, and I'm glad he's in charge of this game that I play literally every day. So this week he came out and said that they got it wrong with Azerite armor being non-tradable, and that from now on it would be, with the same rules applying as to any other gear. You must own another piece of gear in that slot with equal or higher item level. This makes sense and kind of helps clarify the role that Azerite armor even plays. It has much more in common with trinkets than, say, Legion legendaries, and so can be traded as such. We also learned that artifact knowledge will start increasing at the next reset. Yes, the catch-up has already begun, boys. It works a little bit differently in BFA to how it was in Legion. Instead of artifact power you gain from Azerite being worth more, you will instead just need less of it for each new level. So the world quest that gives you 100 AP now will still give you 100 AP next year, not 16 million AP. I think we can all agree that's a more elegant fix. And of course you don't have to do anything to affect this change, it's all gonna happen automatically when you log in next week. We learned about changes to auction house deposits intended to discourage those 1,000 stacks of one posters who are basically the worst human beings on earth, that we should expect some new goblin and worgen models soon. The main topic of conversation for Ian this week though was mob scaling. And if you think I'm going anywhere near that, then you've got another thing coming. Taliesin. Actually, we're not going to talk about it too much because it has been a topic of conversation this week, but it's a subject we've covered on this show in depth before, and with the things Blizzard have said on the subject in the Q&A and in the blue post since, I really don't think it needs too much more attention because this episode is already about five hours long. So here is this story in a nutshell. Basically, some players notice that the eye level scaling that was in place in Legion is also in place in BFA. Why anyone would be surprised at that is unclear, but what it means is, once you hit max level and start growing in power, mobs in the outside world will also start to grow in power. Or rather, just health. They never do more damage. Scaling relative to your growing eye level. Importantly, they don't scale at the same rate as your eye level, so over the course of an expansion, you will still massively outgear these mobs and completely crush them. But you won't outgear them quite as quickly as you would, say, a heroic dungeon where the mob health is fixed. Luckily, the community remembered all this from last time we had this debate, and no, it was a shit show, obviously. I love how my eye level gets higher and mobs get harder. RPGs are about growth and progress. Max level scaling works directly against that. Look, I told you this was the short version this week, but these are two quotes I take specific issue with because they show a willful misunderstanding of the mechanic at play. So if you agree with these two statements, then please bear in mind what I'm about to say is apologizing for Blizzard, it's not fanboying, it's not trying to put a positive slant on things, it's explaining to you something that you have misunderstood. And also, Zach, you owe Pilav $500, okay? Anyway, mobs do not get harder as your eye level gets higher. Think of this as a comparison. If I have longer legs than someone, and every time I take a step forward, I travel two meters, and every time they take a step forward, they travel one meter, then even though we're both moving at the same time, I am getting further and further away away from that diminutive short ass with every step we take. And that's the principle behind mob scaling at max level. Mobs do get easier to kill as your eye level goes up, and the statistics Blizzard shared with us this week prove that. A 120 player in 330 gear is killing world quest foes 40% faster than a 120 in 280 gear. So the statement, max level scaling works directly against that, is also just objectively false. Because clearly, if a player with 18% higher eye level is killing mobs 40 percent quicker, then whatever scaling exists definitely isn't working directly against that, is it? All that proves is that you don't really understand how the scaling works. And yes, there are a couple of very specific thresholds where banking some items would help you kill mobs a few seconds quicker, but let's be honest, in the time it's going to take you to keep travelling to a bank and equipping or unequipping those items, it would have been quicker to have just kept playing and got through the threshold. You can't spend 10 years saying, oh, I want world content to stay more relevant, and then cry because you can't one-shot world 
world mobs in week three of a new expansion. If you want an in-depth and surprisingly rational reasoning behind its implementation in the first place, then honestly, I think Ian knocks it out of the park in the Q&A and subsequent blue posts. So I really think you should check those out. We'll link them below. And I'm purposely trying not to get into my personal opinions about this because those are just the facts. But if you do want a more philosophical argument, how's this? I'm not actually gearing to make world mobs easier to kill. The reason I'm gearing is so I can do harder dungeon and raid content, which is the same reason I've always wanted better gear at max level in WoW, and which is completely unaffected by scaling anyway. And look, look what you've done. Look how long you've made this video now. Do you know when we started making that episode? I don't know, I'm just Five hungry. years ago. Five years ago we started making that. I was younger, now I'm retired. It's new, We've had two new expansions since we started making this video. It's the longest video in the world. I'm really sorry about that. It was all, I think that's the last time we're gonna put Italias in talks. Yeah, let's not, in, let's in not do videos. that. It was stupid, it was a stupid idea. It was your worst idea ever. Yeah. I'm never listening to your stupid uh -huh. ideas again. Because that one was mine. The thing is, it's such a long episode, we might as well talk, it doesn't even matter. We might as well talk now, we might as well set a record. <laughs> Why not? You've hit 120. Yes, I have. How's that going for you? It was great. On Alliance side, uh, yeah. I've been doing I've been doing the Horde this week. Look, that's oh, why we've got the I Horde see. medallion up. That's how we like it. Yeah. You know, because, you know, faction neutrality and yeah. all that. Yeah, um, We go both ways. <laughs> everyone knows it. What was your, do you have any like highlights of your Alliance leveling experience? I really liked Tear Guard sound mm. and it's great. And I'm, I haven't even finished the story in Storm Song yet. And it's cool, but I miss Tear Guard. What did you think of the, of the, of the Quillboard? Uh, I because that's what everyone to... says when you mention Storm Song Valley. They're like, ah, Storm Song, yeah, love yeah. it, love it. Quill balls, hate them. They can just die. I love the music and I love the zone. I really didn't like the quill bores. I see. I like the quill bores. I didn't like the quill I like bores I, I, at all. Because originally, I think the entire zone was all quill balls. Um, oh, you know, I bet. You yeah, know, in Brandon, you know that, that town where the horde attack. Yeah. I think in in some very early alpha. Um, that was actually Quillbores that attacked that town. Um, and then, because so, you, you know, you do the main storyline, suddenly the Quillbores are attacking, and that makes loads more sense to literally everything else that happens in the yeah, zone. Yeah, yeah, and they really like respect you for fighting the Quillbores. Yeah, it's like, and then there's the dude just in a big who hole, mate. dies fine. after being like, it's very. That's a bit of a spoiler. Dude dies. Dude dies. Now, now whenever a dude dies, whether oh, no. it's your dude that you're talking about or not, we're going to get angry messages. Spoilers. Spoilers. Oh, Spoiler man. alert. Dude yeah. dies. It's Quillbore related. Oh. It's just very. They play, they play a much bigger role than I thought they would. <laughs> they, but they did play so much of a bigger yeah, role. they really did. And that's why that's why the Horde attack in Storm Song seems a bit random. Yeah, especially because they're just peons yeah. everywhere. And you I'm just like, like one-shot the exactly. peons. And, and they're, like, like, they're like, the Horde are attacking, we must fight back. And you're like, yeah, we must. We'll fight back, yeah. we'll fight back. And you're like, yeah. good, good. Oh, it's still all going down. Go and go kill some Quillbores. And you're like, what, what about the Horde, though? Because uh, shouldn't we... And you're like, no, the Quillbores yeah. are really nasty. Go and get that. It's like, okay. Yeah. I've been... Doing Doing my horde. Yes. Um, I started leveling as a uh, elemental shaman, oh. which didn't last long. R.I.P. It's fun. It, like it's fine, but it just takes so long to kill things. Yeah. Like I don't know what it's gonna be like in raid or whatever, but its tool set is just so ill-equipped to just questing. You know. But... Um, so I switched to um, enhancement, and I'm, I'm breezing through now. It's nice. Fun. So I'm, I'm 115. I've, I'm going to try and round that for the end of the week and like access those amazing horde cinematics. Yeah. So uh, hopefully we'll have something on those next week as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but thank you for joining us today. If you like this video, don't thank us. Thank our patrons. who give their actual real life money to make these videos happen. Uh, guys, thank you. Without you, they just, well, they wouldn't happen, frankly. No. Nope. If you didn't like it, downvote the shit out of it. Remember, our name is Whispers of War. No, my name is Taliesin. From me... And from me, Evertel. Until next time. Cheerio. <laughs>